it is defamatory. Whether or not she did these things is irrelevant. It, it, the, the bottom line is Netflix out and out, you know, were deceitful and, and lying in what they said and, and done in that series. It wasn't. It, yeah. it wasn't even important. They didn't even need to put it in. I don't see why they uh, why they decided to. Maybe maybe just for dramatic reaction. <laughs> All right, I'm back again with Gavin Stone, and we're continuing our coverage of the Laura Ray interview with Piers Morgan. Now, Laura Ray is a person who came out of the past in response to an interview with a Fiona Harvey that was done with Piers Morgan. Fiona Harvey came out of the woodwork due to the Netflix smash hit Baby Reindeer, where a character in this script was supposedly Fiona Harvey, the character of Martha. Now, Laura Ray has come out to state that she has had run-ins with Fiona Harvey even before that. So if you want to play catch-up to what we've done so far, go and click, click that link above. But before we get rolling, I want to take a minute and talk about some comments with Gavin. How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, we said we would uh, communicate with everybody and we'd take what they said uh, on board. So here we are doing as we promised. Which I like, by the way. And uh, the first comment I want to address is about baselines. Now, somebody put a comment out and I was in a snippy mood and I answered the comment very strongly, much more strongly than I really should have. And I want to stress that right now, but when I put something out there like that, and if I'm snippy, then somebody points out that I'm snippy. If I re was to remove what I said, then that to me is a level of dishonesty. So I'll just leave it out there, but I do want to go into the merits of the comment. And the comment essentially was, that Gavin, especially, baseline Laura Ray off of only one statement. And that, in fact, I believe is not true. It's a matter of just stating, here is something to show you a basic baseline of the person, not cobbling over all elements of the interview that could be seen as baseline. Am I representing that fairly, Gavin? Yeah, I watched the entire thing through several times, um, as well as you know, stopping, pausing, going back, enlarging you know, the, the amount of work that goes into this. We, you know, I don't just watch it and guess and say, "Oh, that's a little bit that I've decided is is a good example for a baseline." That was just a part that I saw that was like, "Okay, we're at the beginning." It sets the tone. It matches and marries up with everything else that goes on later on. It's a good example for us to show people this is a good baseline for her to, to start things off. Okay, now that leads up with another part of the same comment that we're only baselining off of one interview. Mm -hmm. But this is what we have. Yeah. So everything that we are saying is in the context of this one interview. The same way as if... Gavin, um, who's done law enforcement before, was to bring in somebody and talk to that person. He would be establishing all of this information based on just that interview with that person in those circumstances. Yeah. So um, I've explained this to several people and, and, you know, there are a lot of kind of armchair experts and, and internet gurus out there who don't understand that a baseline changes dependent upon your environment, your mood, the amount of sleep you've had last night, the company you're in. There is so much in, in the way of elements that can change a person's baseline. Uh, for example, the way you act with your friends down the bar might be completely different to how you act when you're at your grandmother's house or when you're at a, a funeral or when you're at a court or in a police station. So all these, your baseline will differentiate depending on all the, the, the factors and elements that are going on around you. So what I'm doing there is I'm getting the baseline for her in that moment during that interview at that time. And I'm looking for deviations from that baseline during that time of that interview. So I hope that makes sense. Okay. And then um, 
one criticism that came about is that Mr. Sohn <laughs> isn't very impressive, um, I believe because you are hedging. And, and I would like to push back on that for a second and say, would you like Gavin to be certain in everything he says and to state things affirmatively when there are degrees of interpretation? Or would you rather we are honest and do our best job in representing what we see, but not stating things as absolute truth? Uh, and I'll just add to that as well. Um, anybody out there that is is, is an absolutist, um, is, 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 they're, not, they're, they're not what they say they are. There is nobody who can be 100% certain that they know what another person is thinking. It's as simple as that. All we have is high percentage indicators that will say this person is uncomfortable or something's not right or something's out of place there. You know, th that's all you can say because that's what you see. It's a bit like watching catchphrases and they reveal a little bit at a time. You know, it's uh, it's it's just it's one of those things you you can't be you can never be one hundred percent sure certain what's going on inside another person's head. Also, we could be wrong mm -hmm. because we literally were wrong in one of our analysis of Fiona Harvey. Both Gavin and I heard her say yes, but she in fact said peers. Mm -hmm. And her accent threw me, and I didn't realize it. Gavin didn't realize it, so it changed the entire context of what we said just because we misheard one word. Mm -hmm. So we do try to be open and say, we can be wrong. Mm -hmm. This is not definitive. This is an opinion. This is what we're seeing. Again, it can shape. And as we go, our opinion may be changing too. We don't know. We have to look at the rest of this and see if the analysis holds up. Now, the last point, I want to cover, and this one has come up in a lot of these videos. Why do we think we can analyze these people without watching the whole series? Mm -hmm. So I do ask you a question. What benefit is it for us to watch the series to watch actors playing somebody else? So you're not even watching the actual person. And the series has been scripted. It has music to manipulate. It has everything else. What possible extra benefit is it for our feelings to be influenced by watching a highly produced drama? It's only going to make us biased, if anything. Yes, and that's how I feel. So th those who are saying that, a lot of times I deliberately find things and I give them to Gavin because he hasn't seen them. He doesn't know who the person is. Mm -hmm. He's clueless. And I think that, in fact, that lends to better overall reads because he doesn't have an opinion at a time. Yeah. I, I, that's, yeah. Uh, for me, I'm completely unbiased with a lot of this stuff that Eric sends me because I don't know, and more importantly, don't care uh, about uh, what's going on in these people's lives, who they are, whether they're a celebrity or whatever else. I, I will just look, say what I see, uh, give my analysis at the end of it all uh, and job done. And, and that's, you know, from a point of view, like that doesn't have any kind of pretext or, or idea of what's going on in, in, you know, the rest of, uh, uh, you know, that person's life, as it were, which it actually helps a hell of a lot, believe it or not. But anyway, thank you still for all the comments. Please keep them coming. Um, we do receive them and we do learn from them. Like I, my reaction was way too strong on that, on that first comment I discussed. I need to learn that. I need to perform my typical behavior is if, if I feel a strong reaction to a comment, ignore it and then go back later to revisit it. I forgot that ignore it step. <laughs> I need to do better. So a lot of times I do have to let something sink in. Certain words can trigger us a certain way. None of us are immune. That one, I just felt really defensive of Gavin and I was snippy. Oh. So well, fine, for being good. snippy, I apologize. <laughs> um, but we are going to continue on with this Laura Ray interview. We still have uh, several more clips to go. And let's just see how she's holding up. And your letter to me when you when you contacted me was unfortunately for me, I'm now collateral damage 
because Netflix allowed Miss Harvey to be so easily identifiable, which I think is inarguable. Um, have Netflix made any attempt to approach you? Well, their solicitors spoke to me. They, they contacted somebody through the mail on Sunday who then contacted me and asked me, would I speak to their lawyers? So I had a, a conversation with them and really what they wanted from me was a copy of the interim. And when was this? About a week ago, I spoke to them. A week ago, but you hadn't heard from them before that? I hadn't heard from them before that. Certainly nobody approached me to say there's going to be a story coming out in mm. which it will be very obvious that you are one of the victims. Okay, now I believe, Gavin, some of these clips we're putting together to lay out the case mm -hmm. of what has actually happened with um, Netflix and what they're doing. And this is this is the start of that, because I have been highly critical of Netflix. I find it shocking. And I hope everyone else is watching. By the way, that was another comment that came through. Why are we defending Fiona Harvey? We're not defending Fiona Harvey. Mm -hmm. Two things can be true at once. Fiona Harvey may be a nightmare. I don't know. But w what I'm hearing from Laura Ray does make her sound like somebody I don't want to hang out with. But Netflix could also have been irresponsible in revealing people to the public. And now we're going with Laura Ray here. This is a, another person who was brought up who is collateral damage in her opinion. And the Netflix lawyers didn't bother talking to her. Nobody bothered talking to her until a week before this interview where, where the show had been out, I think, for like a month. Mm-hmm. Not only that, they were only talking to her because they wanted something from her. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, or need something from her. Mm, yeah. So you know. So um, and, and this is this is something that you know we like, like Eric said there. We're not necessarily defending anybody. What we're trying to do is you know we, we're trying to analyze what we see. We're trying to put the pieces together. Uh, and and definitely you know whether whether somebody's done something or not, Netflix still has a duty of care. And this is I don't know how many people now that have been harassed through the the kind of production of, of this particular play because it wasn't there another guy that got falsely accused or they, they, they misidentified him or something like that and uh, he was accused of, of some sexual harassment crime i i don't know about that going you know any further i do know laura i know fiona i know this it's it it, it just keeps it keeps going and it is very frustrating especially when People want to carry water for it, saying um, the character, you know, was who said this. It's like Netflix said it is a true story. Netflix went in front of Parliament and said it's a true story. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else <laughs> you want, but don't worry, we will hammer that point a little bit more as we go. Yeah, we certainly do. Um, <laughs> and now, is there any body language, anything in there that? was of interest to you everything was pretty congruent to be honest with you i just wanted to to put that part in because it is going to be relevant to to what's coming up later with some of the netflix revelations that we've got going on um you know and, and like i say it, it, this is very it's been very unfair on a, a lot of people and, and also the whole um kind of statement from from gad saying look don't look for the people out there that may have or may have not been portrayed in this uh, literally ended up having the Streisand effect. For those who don't know, the, uh, are you familiar with the Streisand effect at all? Yeah, so yeah. The Streisand effect is when a a photographer who was taking coastline pictures, um, I believe from a plane, along California, took one picture of a Malibu shot, and that shot included Barbara Streisand's house. Now, when that photograph came out, uh, I don't know. There might have been 50 people who saw it. It was a very low number. It was a very specialized thing. But Barbara Streisand threw a fit about the picture, and then everybody rushed to look at the picture. If she had said nothing, nobody would have really known anything. And also, they may not have even known it was her house. She identified her own house. She made a ruckus out of it, and she brought the attention. Yeah. So, so yes. yeah, uh, which is exactly what Richard Gad's done here. You know, by by turning around and saying, "Look, don't look for these people." You know, it, it's you know, you know, I have said it before. It does have the adverse effect of kind of, ooh, you know. So we can, they can be found. Then let's see what we can find. Yeah, you've been on the internet lately. <laughs> Go and tell them what to do and not to do. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sure it'll work out for you. <laughs>
Do you think from that it would be correct to assume they're maybe panicking a bit, Netflix, about the fallout from all this? Well, I, I really don't know. I can't speak I mean, to This is very odd to me. They've asked you for documentary evidence to support something which is a major plank of their series. Yeah. Well, I suppose they've got to show that what they have done is materially true or substantially true. I'm not Was what they put it. in Baby Reindeer materially true about you? Yes. Right. Well, in the sense that there was a character who was a mother, mm. that there was nothing of that in mind. But the, the thrust of it, which was that she was sacked from a law firm and mm. turned on her boss, that's true. Yeah. Um, that somebody in it was a barrister. That's I'm now a barrister, so I think that's where that bit comes from. And the bit about the, the, the sick stalker targeting the deaf child is absolutely clearly a reference taken along with everything else. No question. I mean, that's just straight from this story. All right, and we continue, <laughs> and uh, well, she's she's very careful. Again, she's she you know Pierce loaded it up. Mm -hmm. So is Netflix trying to cover their ass? <laughs> and she's like, I don't know for sure. And she seemed to temper the remarks. Yeah, um, and, and she there could have been a lot of different ways that she could have gone with this. I think at the moment she's kind of uh, in a, in a very unique position. Um, because it, it is made clear a little bit later on, if if Fiona Harvey ends up with, I think it's the eleven, is it eleven million pounds she's suing for? Apparently, I don't know. I've I've seen one hundred and seventy million. I've heard eleven million. I I don't know, but lots of money. Yeah. So, but I, I mean, she does make it clear that that if if Fiona Harvey gets the eleven million, she's going after Fiona Harvey. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and she, she said that we've got that clip coming up later on. Um, on the other uh, side of things, um, if Fiona Harvey loses that case, she might think, okay, where, where has she lost? Now I can go after them and I can kind of uh, have my bite of the cherry, as it were, and, and, and see where, where she went wrong to make sure I get it right. So that's probably where she's at at the minute. On the other side, there might be a chance where, you know, she could approach Netflix and just say, look, if you give me a certain amount of money, we'll just forget the whole thing happened and job done. So, again, I'm only guessing here. It's a little bit of speculation. I really don't know. Um, but I don't think she wants to upset anybody at, at this particular stage. I think she she's wants to hold all the cards and, and, and see where they lay from there. Uh, yes, and anything she says in this interview can be used in court later if this does become a... A full-blown trial. Exactly. I mean, I'm sure she's going to be a witness. Mm -hmm. Oh, no doubt, yeah. When you saw that exchange, what went through your mind? I, I was horrified. I mean, I've actually watched your interview a few times because the first time I saw it, I was in such shock watching her, mm -hmm. seeing her, it just brought it all back again. And I've watched it several times to see what is it she's saying about me. And it's unbelievable that after the things she did, that she can say she wasn't harassing my family. Of course she was harassing my family. For many years. For many years. For longer than Richard Gadd. So again, with that one, we've, we've got this, this ongoing consistency, which I really, really like. You know, she, this, I don't want to sound like I'm kind of beating the same old drum here, um, but if she'd have said any of those statements and something really, really stood out, there was something that deviated highly from the baseline on a massive cluster, uh, then I'd have been jumping on it and saying, that doesn't add up and marry up with everything we've seen so far. Um, you know, the usual head movements, the usual openness, and the usual posture. It was mentioned in one of the comments um that she has to um speak a particular way and and, uh, and not embellish <laughs> as a lawyer um, <laughs> uh, the lawyers i've been around yeah i was gonna say <laughs> I, i've been to court many many times uh over different things i've been a witness in different things I've, I've, I've worked with a lot of lawyers and and the same sentence put it in a completely different way can make something yeah. sound so much more harsh or not whatever the case may be. For example, um, you know, she could turn around and say something when we were on about the five years that, that she mentioned uh, in yesterday's video, um, you know, she can turn around and say she left me um, annoying messages on my answer phone for five years, or she can say exactly the same facts, but change the delivery by saying she harassed me for half a decade. It's yep. the same thing. It's just delivered in a different way. And it's so oh, much worse. So, so I just thought I'd put that out there because somebody did say, you know, oh, lawyers can't embellish. Lawyers embellish for a living. <laughs> they, well, uh, if you think about it, lawyers are putting on a show mm -hmm. in a courtroom. I mean, 
you don't typically watch lawyers just not drive a narrative. Mm -hmm. They are pleading a side and their side, they wish to win. And they're not going to, you know, usually step back. They quite frequently are going to exaggerate any point in their favor and lessen any point that is against them. Yeah. So they definitely are shaping a narrative oh, that's yeah. built into it. Um, so, um, absolutely. You've only got to watch the uh, the musical Chicago. Um, it gives you a brilliant idea of you know, <laughs> how, how the courtroom really, really works. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, that, and that's how it is. And at the same time, they can also play things down. Uh, you know, if, if they feel that, you know, something's – they can make the severity of something sound a lot less if they're on the defence. So, you know, so the, these play on words are something that, that is done quite frequently. Again, she's not doing any of that here. She's, you know, she's, <laughs> she's just stating clear, concise facts. But it says that she was yeah. convicted, for example, for four and a half years for what she did to you and your family. Well, she wasn't convicted for that. I didn't press any kind of criminal charges. So that is untrue. So that's untrue. I mean, again, back to Netflix's duty of care, they're making it very easy for both Fiona Harvey and you to be quickly identified. Yeah. And yet a material fact that she was sent to prison for four and a half years for harassing you and your family, like it appears the same thing that Richard Gadd is saying about what happened to him, yeah. that neither of those things may be true. Well, it doesn't appear they are true. And you're a lawyer. It's quite a serious leap to go from somebody who may be harassing people, trolling a nasty, abusive person to a, a convicted criminal. Do you think? Well, I agree with you. I mean, I don't think for the sort of things she did to me, even if I had pressed for some kind of criminal conviction, mm. I don't think she would have got very long, if any kind of custodial sentence. Mm. And there we have it. We, a definitive lie that has been proven um, against Netflix because she knows she didn't press charges. Now, there's been questions over and over and over and over. Does she have a criminal record? Does she not? Blah, 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 blah. Was she convicted? Well, we know for a fact now that at least in one case of the statement, it's a lie. It is completely false. Yeah. Um, I mean, it shows, uh, you know, I mean, everything else um, in, in this kind of series, as it were, has been so easy to be able to say, look, this is that person. Let's identify this person. They, they, you know, they, they've, they've put all the breadcrumbs out. It's been so easy to find these people, which when mixed these kind of truths and lies together creates a really, really serious smoke screen because what happens is if people, you know, they go, oh, this Laura Ray, she's a real person. This really happened. This really happened. Then they say, oh, then this really happened in this pub. And, and you know, uh, so if all of that really happened, People draw the conclusion that the sentence really happened too, or the prison uh, custodial sentence happened too. And because of it, they end up getting uh, an idea or an impression uh, which ends up being false. And, and it, it is defamatory. Whether or not she did these things is irrelevant. It, it, the, the bottom line is Netflix out and out you know, were deceitful and, and lying in what they said and, and done in that series. It wasn't. It, yeah. it wasn't even important. They didn't even need to put it in. I don't see why they uh, why they decided to. Maybe maybe just for dramatic reaction. <laughs> Do you have any doubt that she is a dangerous stalker? I have no doubt she's a dangerous stalker. No doubt whatsoever. She seems well, firm on that. Yeah. So I wanted I wanted this in there because it quite simply there was no wishy washy speech there. There was no there was no no clunky talking. There was there was nothing that um, kind of uh, indicated. And, and I've seen this this in in both convicted criminals and, and accused criminals and people who are guilty time and time again. You'll ask them a question. Did you steal the cookie? And they go, well, I, I didn't. I didn't see any cookies when I came in, or whatever the case may be. And that, so that they they don't necessarily answer the question directly, um, and they'll stutter and it'll be clunky and there'll be all the other tells. There was none of that there. She directly answered, "I have every belief that she's a, a, a you know a dangerous stalker, or whatever it was." The the words where I won't say verbatim. I don't want to get caught out by the internet police. Um, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but but the uh, but the, the the bottom line is, you know, she she straight denial of. of you know the fact that you know, you know she she believes she's a uh, a dangerous stalker. Have you considered suing her? Well, I am considering suing her, and certainly if Netflix give her eleven million pounds, I'll be suing her. Mm. 
<laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah. I mean, so there is a, a a motive. Now, I am curious though. Why? And I this is to everybody who's legally minded in the audience. I'm not a lawyer. I know a lot of them. I don't understand how she could sue Fiona Harvey if Fiona Harvey were to prevail against Netflix, because it wasn't Fiona Harvey that revealed information potentially that could lead to Laura Ray. It's Netflix. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about you. She's throwing this out there like, oh, if there's going to be money, I want a piece of it. But I don't know if she legitimately could have a piece of that money. Please let us know in the comments below what you think. Yeah, I'll be interested to know where she stands on that because it's been a long, long time. I mean, this was something that happened in the 90s. You know, this is this is you know 30 odd years ago. Um, we are looking at the fact that, uh, you know, the court will see it for what it is. They'll see it for the fact that, hang on, you, you've, not, you've not wanted anything from anybody up until the point that she's just all of a sudden got 11 million pounds and now all of a sudden the claws are out. So um, that being said, I also understand that you can't really sue anybody that doesn't have anything. I mean, you can, but it, it's, sure. it's, it's, it's a nightmare process, uh, and it's also very expensive and, and <laughs> isn't really worthwhile at the end of it all financially. So, But, but you got to sue them over something. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I, I'm just going, what is she going to sue her for? Yeah. You know, the, 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 the bit, you know, what happened between them, I'm, I'm not excusing that. Mm -hmm. But she never pressed charges, chose not to, nothing happened. Statute of limitations seemed to exist. So if it's that her information got out there, again, Fiona Harvey didn't do that. That's Netflix. So it's not, that would be Richard Gadd. Yeah. That would be Netflix, potentially. Well, you know, First of all, there's no statute of limitations over here in the UK. So oh, okay. there's no expiry date on crime. So, hmm. um, so in, in the UK... If if something it doesn't matter if it's historic to as far back as a hundred years, uh, if you're still alive and you did something uh, and you're caught for it a hundred years later, if you're lucky enough to live that long, you can you can still be uh, okay. you know, charged for it. So um, so that, that's the first thing. Secondly, um, I mean, you know, yeah, uh, it, it is hard to say what she would be suing for. She could go down the route of, of loss of earnings because you know she's filled up tapes on an answering machine which prevented genuine customers getting through blah 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 this, this, as a lawyer she but probably, she did charges before no she didn't no so so like i said this this will be seen as in my opinion you know hang on a minute you've not wanted to know for the last 30 years but now she's got a load of money yeah. all of a sudden you want your slice of the pie so but that being said in, in her defense, she could also argue the fact that, well, yeah, she had nothing to sue for previously, <laughs> so there was nothing to get out of her. Now she's got $11 million. You know, I want my my share, as it were, for, for the damages that she caused me. So it's, it's kind of, it's a bit hit and miss. Personally, I think she'd be better going after Netflix. Um, yeah, I, I would say, oh, hey, you know what? I'm going to go after them too. Yeah, uh, and yeah. there's nothing stopping her going after both. Oh, oh I, I guess. I mean, I don't know. Again, I don't know the law there. Um, you know, as you pointed out clearly, <laughs> I, I got statute of limitations wrong. So um, obviously, I don't know that, but I do. I do want to hear from everybody because it it just seems sounds good. Just doesn't seem directionally right. One of the Netflix chief ex executives is the Netflix policy chief. He went into the UK Parliament several weeks ago and he said this: "Baby Ranger is an extraordinary story." And it is obviously a true story of the horrific um, abuse that um, the writer and protagonist Richard Gadd suffered um, at the hands of a convicted stalker. We did take every reasonable precaution in um, disguising the real life identities of the, of, of, of the people um, you know, involved in that, um, in that story. Your response to that? Well, I, I disagree completely with what he says. That's mm. just not the case. Mm. And I do as well. Mm -hmm. And that is the whole point that I've been harping on. It's, it's not just the misleading nature of the project, but when Benjamin King goes in front of Parliament or whatever it is, and here we have a letter to Benjamin King at your appearance on the 8th of May, okay, it was the House of Commons, 
Culture, Media, and Sports Committee. I asked you about the Netflix series Baby Reindeer and specifically the duty of care to the woman now identified as Martha from the series. You told me the following. Baby Reindeer is obviously a true story of the horrific abuse that the writer suffered at the hands of a convicted stalker. That's the word that's going to cause the problem. Journalists thus far have been unable to find a record of the conviction to which you referred. Can you provide me with the evidence for the serious claim that you made to me at the select committee? And this is John Nielsen, or Nicholson, sorry, MP, Member of Parliament for Ochil and South Perthshire. I don't know if I said that right. You did, but yeah, I th- uh, well, I think so. Um, but yeah, th- so this is a um, obviously a, um, a parliamentary hearing at the House of Commons um, where he, he's under oath. Uh, so everything he said is going to be uh, recorded, absolutely every single word. Uh, and he said the words convicted um, stalker. True story, mm-hmm. convicted stalker. Even Richard Gadd wasn't saying that. <laughs> we played that, and Richard Gadd said it was a, a combination of things, and he, he was much more mealy mouth. This guy flat out said it's true. Mm-hmm. Flat out said it. And he's under oath. So everybody who's yelling and saying, What are you talking about? What are you talking about? That's what I'm talking about. And here we have this. I can't determine the veracity of it. But this is supposedly a screenshot of a records request. I don't know what they call this, but essentially her name, police records of convictions, cautions, reprimands, and warnings, none recorded. That blows a hole in it. (laughs) <laughs> so um therefore yeah and um, what you've got there so that, that, that's called a dbs check um so it's, it's the english equivalent of a criminal records background check um and the way it works here in in, in the uk is uh, certain jobs and certain positions and that kind of thing you're automatically no matter who you are you're automatically barred from those jobs until you've had this DBS check, and that stands for debarring service. Um, what that mm. does, it then checks for any criminal convictions, records, etc. Um, when you get when you get that certificate, that DBS certificate, you are then debarred, and you can then work in that particular role or job. So that's what a, a, a DBS check is, and you can also see on there. Not only did it have her name, but there was another section which I, I, it may have been redacted. I'm not sure which said other names. Um, yes. Is it, is it, yeah. So there. Uh, Muir, Fiona, Margaret. Mm-hmm. So, um, and when the DBS do, do these checks, they also ask if you've ever been known by any other names. Um, so they will check this out to see if, if, you know, if you've changed your name by deed poll, by marriage, blah, blah, blah. Um, which she said she has, um, which obviously she would have to, uh, have declared. So at the end of the day, that's why. Uh, you know, the the that shows uh, that she's, she's got no criminal records or convictions at all. Exactly. So what we found in the series, though, is she did get an interim interdict, mm-hmm. apparently, mm-hmm. but she has no convictions or has never even been charged with any crime, period. Correct. That's right, and an interim interdict won't won't kind of show up on any of these searches because because it is it, so if it's never if it's never established that an interdict was needed um, or one was never granted then it, then it's kind of it, after the year and a day expires um, and and that's it. So um, for example, I could I could get one on you, Eric. I could say right, I want an interim interdict on Eric. I think he's going to come over to England and kill me in my sleep. Right um, now, mm. they put that in place. Uh, Because I say he could be on a plane now. They put that in place pending a full interdict or injunction being put in place. Now, if you don't ever come in that year and a day, and there's no further threats, then it's just gone and erased and deleted, and 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 it's not it expires and that's it. Because if 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 that showed up every time you went for a job for something that you never did and that never happened, just something I thought that would happen. Imagine the 
the kind of interference that would create for you. And it's exactly the same for anybody else in the country. If everybody who had a one of these interim interdicts was was mm-hmm. barred from certain jobs or whatever the case may be, you could literally create hell for somebody by just going and because anybody can apply for one. So, right, right. It's like a restraining order. A restraining order is not a conviction. Exactly. It's not even a charge. Mm-hmm. It is an accusation. Um, and even that's not there. And I think the basic premise of a restraining order is, look, stay apart from each other. There seems to be a problem. Mm-hmm. And then it could lead into something else. But in of itself, a restraining order is not um, indicative of a crime. Yeah. Um, it's not an indictable offence or, or that would show up on a criminal record background check. So, and, and that's pretty much the same here in the UK. Uh, things like restraining orders, as far as I'm aware, don't show up unless there's a need or there's been a conviction. Yeah. Uh, All right. <laughs> so this wraps up our exploration of Laura Ray, who I still find believable. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's consistent the whole way through in many ways, some would say a boring subject (laughs) because she's not, you know, she's not hedging. She's just very, very, um, forthcoming, but I want to know what you think. And also if something else breaks on this, another interview, another thing that's interesting, we'll definitely be sure to cover it. So you may want to subscribe, hit the bell, and get notified. We'll also probably be doing a little bit of analysis. Coming up, we're going to be doing RFK Jr., who answered a question in a really interesting way. (laughs) So you might want to check that out. For now, thank you so much. Thank you.